Hello everyone, my name is Caroline Nicolet. I'm a heritage interpreter and I run my own company, Pario Gallico, for living history and experiential archaeology in the UK. My research focuses on Iron Age wall paintings from pigment making to wall construction. I would like to present how open air museums can champion sustainability in the built environment. And when I mention sustainability, it mainly is really focused on the building and construction methods, which means sustainability by using local, natural, renewable material, which is done and developed nowadays in the 21st century and has been used for our history. When I mean the built environment is really the reconstructed buildings that can be seen and found visited on many open air museums, but also the modern construction, be it a visitor center, a cafe, offices, and so on and so forth. So it really encompasses everything that is constructed on site. I'll focus on archaeological open air museums just because of my research and my interest, and mainly on Iron Age uh, reconstructed buildings. Now, these replica buildings are mainly interesting to me because they are the most visible experiments on the sites, usually. They are very long lasting and they really provide an experience of archaeology to the visitors. So in terms of experiential archaeology, you can you can feel, you can relate to a building by comparing with your modern ways of living, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. What people see, they will remember. There's also quite a lot of new experiments going on on building techniques, be it flooring, roofing materials, wall constructions, or especially for me, uh, painting, creating the pigments, the brushes, but also the binders and how to apply them. To conduct my own experiments, I realized that I needed a good canvas to, to validate them. And that's the same for all of the other experiments. We need to start by something that is comparable to the archeological finds that we see and base ourselves on. For that reason, I needed a good understanding of materials, but also of techniques that would allow me to reconstruct a wall, for example, that would be similar to the finds that I'm working from and that I will present right now. I mainly work from two different sets of finds. The first one is in Vix, uh, in Burgundy, in France, in the northeast of France, and they are sets of fragments of burnt, painted daub walls from the Iron Age. The important thing for me is that they are both painted, but also constructed in a much more complex and finer ways than we usually think. Instead of having just clay mixes, clay daub on wattle, on woven branches, we can see that there's daub and then there's one, sometimes two different layers of smooth render, finer, thinner every time, then a whiting, sort of white paint, and the colored paint on top. This is very different from what we usually see in several open air museums when reconstructed. The second set of finds is from Venungen in central Germany from roughly the same time period. We can see there that they have used two, at least two different sizes of paintbrushes, though we don't have much more information than that. And some fragments seems to show the same construction with different layers, whiting, paints, and sometimes some corners for openings like windows and doors. But this is what I usually see in open air museums, the ones that I know of and I visit, so it's not applicable to everybody. At the Ancient Technology Center, especially as I worked there for quite a, um, quite some years, I know that the daub is usually one layer. It is painted and whitened, so that's always a really good example. But the walls look pretty badly made, if I may say so myself. They are not smooth, one single layer, and they look really, really rough, which gives the visitor a very confusing idea, a very different idea from what we see in the actual archaeological finds. Other example at Butza, absolutely beautiful. Unfortunately, the daub is cracked, which is something that we don't seem to find in the archaeology. And that is completely preventable, depending on good mixes and techniques. 
These are two examples that I would like to see in every single open air museum <laughs> everywhere. The walls are absolutely beautifully made. They are painted, clean, etc. It gives the visitor a perfect impression of what we see and would like to portray in the archaeology. Now to arrive to this, I needed a dialogue between natural building professionals and archaeology, and that I found is really missing wherever I go. We don't tend to see natural builders understanding archaeology and ancient methods that could be applied to modern 21st century problems in natural construction. And in Open Air Museum, we seem to lack the training, the understanding, the, the techniques to actually make proper earthen walls and earthen paints. Open Air Museum can really bring so much to the natural building world and so many other people. They are experimental archaeologists, they are apprentices and builders and staff and volunteers. Basically, space is a key point. In Open Air Museums, there's quite a lot of space, but it's about creating a safe space for these experiments to be able to run. I mean space, I mean safe in a very professional capacity. When working in the construction industry, natural builders don't usually have the opportunity to choose the technique or the materials they want to work with or experiment with because clients might not fancy waiting a few weeks, let alone a few months, for things to dry, settle and cure, like on the top here, um, a chalk floor in the pavilion at the Ancient Technology Center. They might not want some products to be used. So on chalk floors, you might mix them with milk, which gives a smell for the first two to three weeks and so on and so forth. You also need a, a space where you can experiment without worrying too much about finances and time constraints, which will always applies in any case. But as an experiment, especially bringing in um, apprentices, schools, volunteers, visitors, you might be able to get grants, you might create partnerships with many other um, suppliers and creators and bring together a sort of community interested in that very same idea. You also begin to be safer on the architectural, the engineering and legislation side of things, simply because people will not be living permanently in these replica houses, they are not dwellings, they are public visiting sites. So you create a space where people can get idea and actually experiments quietly, calmly and safely and share their knowledge. That's another one of the things that Open Air Museums really bring is the opportunity for the exchange of knowledge, education, enjoyment, reflection and sharing. Creating a community is all very well, but it's about listening and bringing people together. First of all, here, of course, creating a dialogue between archaeology, archaeologists, experimental archaeology, and professional builders, heritage craftspeople, whoever will be helpful onto that specific project. You will also get a lot of participants. You might get some volunteers. You might even get ideas from school children but it creates this opportunity for everybody to express themselves and try to mix and match. I usually say that archeologists might not understand um, modern traditional techniques of construction and need a bit of training, but similarly, professional traditional builders don't sometimes understand or take into account that some techniques have evolved and what we have as traditional 21st century craft might be even too modern for some experiments, for example, Iron Age houses dating back to 3000 years. Showcasing ancient natural buildings and comparing them to modern natural and sustainable building materials is to me the most important point that open air museums can bring to natural building, um, the natural building community. Of course, we will have replica buildings and we also get modern, modern visits, uh, visitor centers, maybe modern cafes, offices, and I, I put there down uh, eco toilets. They are all spaces that exist and 
usually have to exist on open and museum sites, but that we don't quite consider as important or potentially as um, as practical as the replica buildings in the sense of bringing in visitor uh, appeal or creating projects. It would be very interesting to have projects like the one at the top, the grassroots hutting project uh, that is in Scotland. Um, it's Archeobild and the University of Edinburgh and the Historic Environment Scotland working together at Common Croft. This looks like an Iron Age round house. It has been built using archaeological finds, usually post holes, so a floor plan, if you like, and works with hyperlocal natural materials only to create an archaeo-inspired modern building. This space will be an education space. It could become a, a visitor space as well for people to uh, to spend a night, to spend a few hours. Uh, and so on and so forth, that has not been decided yet. What is absolutely certain is that it is 200% a modern building. We'll have double glazed windows, we'll have a stove inside. It, it's not a replica building from an Iron Age site, though it will look like it and it allowed people to actually experiment with every natural material, traditional techniques and ancient um, ancient finds that were available on site. I chose this photo as a last thank you for your attention because that grassroots hunting project has been absolutely key for me in my understanding of how archaeology and natural building can work together to bring the best out of both worlds. As you can see, the house is set up in quite a, a, a rural and open environment. You might see that there's a lot of bracken on the left. So that house has a bracken roof with turf layers. The turf and stone walls have been extracted from the direct site all around it. And the University of Edinburgh is actually conducting some environmental um, recordings to see if using these materials as an ancient building material, but as a potential modern answer to um, creating a more sustainable, more renewable kind of housing solutions, how these extractions of materials impact or not the natural environment all around it. So from there, you have a university, Historic Environment Scotland as well, providing grants to support such a project that is deeply rooted in archaeology and talking to researchers who have done surveys on this very site. So I hope this has given you a few ideas about what could be done uh, to potentially get in touch with your local natural builders. Even if you don't see any, don't know any, trust me, they are there. And if you are in the UK, please do try to contact Ibuki, um, the Earth Building UK and Ireland Association. For the rest, don't hesitate to send me an email and I'll try to answer any questions. Thank you very much and have a nice evening.